All right, we'll call today's meeting to order. Councillor Schreier and I left this room approximately, let's see, about uh, 10 hours ago when we finished the 14 hour council session. There was some concern about six, whether we'd be able to get in the room. With figuring council might go another 15 hours, but it uh, raised to a finish at 11.30 p.m. And here we are at 9.30 a.m. the next day, same room. So welcome, the, the, this is the April 30th meeting of the Winnipeg Food Council. We meet today on Treaty One land, the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. My name is Brian Mays. I'm the City Council for St. Vital Ward. I'll be chairing today's meeting. Uh, we do have quorum. Uh, thanks all for attending. Uh, sincere thanks to everybody for making uh, time to, to join the meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, so yes, we're, we're Yes, yeah, so we have Councilor Schreier here and our vice chair there is uh, Dead Center, LaVon, um, and we have thanks to everyone for, for attending. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, what, what first? We would need adoption of our last uh, regular meeting, which was on February 26th, as well as the special meeting, which was on March 31st. Yes, and we're joined by our former and Interim, apparently, uh, coordinator uh, Jeanette Civile, who is here from the Office of Sustainability. Thanks, Jeanette, for joining us, as well as city clerk staff who weren't on that marathon meeting, but we're still taking my emails at 11 p.m. impressively. So thank you for that. So, uh, yes, we'll have Councillor Councilor Shire. Can you move acceptance of the minutes of those two previous meetings? Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, all those in favor? Thank you. Uh, so those are passed. So relatively light agenda today, but uh, we've had some people uh, who are who are waiting to give us their presentation, and I know a lot of work's been done on a couple of these items. So, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, where to first? Uh, take us take us through here. I'm, I'm not at my best. I got to admit that was a long day yesterday. No problem. Okay, so the first presenter we have scheduled is Dan Nenard of Manitoba 211 to speak in respect to United Way 211 services and work with local food banks. So we're just, we've got Mr. Leonard admitted here. If you're able to unmute yourself. Yes, hello. We're ready for your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for making time for me. I'm going to share my screen, which hopefully um you will be able to see uh and if you have any issues by all means let me know looks good okay great yeah so i'm daniel leonard i'm the two-on-one manitoba director for the united way winnipeg uh and so wanted to present to you a bit about what two-on-one manitoba is it's a relatively new service to winnipeg um and to talk a little bit about how it can be useful for, for the Food Council, for, for policy considerations, et cetera. Uh, so I'll go through this uh, fairly quickly. PowerPoint's not my favorite. So uh, we'll go through it very quickly, but hopefully give some, some time for questions or conversation as, as you wish. Um, so United Way's 2-on-1 Manitoba program is a service that connects people to existing government, social, and health resources. So, um, we provide a 24 seven service in 150 languages. If someone calls 211 uh, or visits our website, then we um, assess their needs and connect them to any sort of existing uh, service that might help them in, in uh, whatever situation they're in. So that we will get into a bit more specifically of what that might be, but um, whether that be um, a need for food and, and food banks, whether that's struggling with addiction and needing resources for addiction services, it's quite a diverse um, grouping of needs. And so um, people can call 211, um, uh, just dial 211 on their phone, and, and they're connected to a uh, service navigator who can help them out. Um, so, who uses 211? Generally, we find uh, quite a large number of the people that use 211 are um, individuals who have the need, but also family members who have the need. So we receive calls from um, you know, individuals in other provinces who maybe have grandparents in Manitoba who have a particular type of need, uh, and they will call us and we will help connect them to that existing resource. Right now, we're getting quite a large number of calls around immunization information, um, transportation to um, vaccines, public health order information. Um, so we get a large number of calls from people just wanting that sort of general type of, of information. 
Um, we also get a lot of um, calls from uh, first responders and social workers, um, people working in health clinics. Um, if you are experience, working with a particular client and they um, you know, may be at your office for a particular reason, but let's say they're at a doctor's office getting a checkup on something, uh, but have, you know, to use the example again, an addictions um, related uh, thing that they want to work through, uh, they can be referred to two on one who will help assess them on their particular needs and, and connect them to a service that that may help help them out. Um, two on one is relatively new to Manitoba, but it's not new uh, to Canada. So the first two on one line came in Toronto in 2002. Um, and in Manitoba, we launched two-on-one in 2017, but it was only an online resource. Um, in October, October 15th to be exact, we launched the phone line here in Manitoba with uh, an investment of federal funding, partly COVID related, that there was a large demand for people to have access resources that they weren't um, used to accessing before, either through a loss of employment, um, or various health considerations that they were going through. Uh, and so we launched the phone line in Manitoba in, in uh, October. And just to say that while we are United Way Winnipeg, the phone line is available to anyone in, in Manitoba. Uh, when people make a call to two on one, the, these calls are answered by what we call service navigators. So these are individuals who are trained. Um, they receive certification that is an ongoing certification process. They're trained in crisis prevention, suicide prevention, they're trained in uh, anti-racism and cultural sensitivity. Uh, and so there's, there's a high degree of um, quality assurance that goes with the calls that come in. When people call, we have a standard that they only remain on hold for 80 seconds uh, before they are kicked to another, another call center, essentially. I won't get into all the operations of how that happens. Um, but yeah, we, we try to make sure that people, when they call, um, they get help quickly and in a professional um, uh, and helpful manner. That service is available in 24 seven in over 150 languages, including indigenous languages. So uh, right now we're working with newcomer organizations in Winnipeg um, to allow 2 on one to provide a sort of one-stop shop for newcomers uh, who are, are new to Winnipeg. Uh, there has been a large uptick in, in calls. So in terms of the volume and demand, we are uh, just past the 8,500 uh, call number since launching in October. That, that continues to go up right now. We are averaging in the last uh, bit uh, around 400 calls uh, per week uh, that we get. And the majority of those calls come from Winnipeg. So 80% of those calls are, are coming from Winnipeg. Certainly uh, the pandemic has increased the, the volume of calls that we get, um, but the call, calls are continue to be diverse uh, in terms of the reasons that people are calling. Uh, and the value of two on one. So when people call, um, it's not as simple as, you know, thinking of a phone book, it's, it's a wraparound service. And so um, you get a real personalized service, which is one of the, the key pieces of this. Someone may call and, and wanna access a food bank, um, but instead of just sending them to a local food bank, we may ask, uh, you know, why do you need a food bank? Oh, you lost employment. Um, here's also an employment organization that can assist you to get back on your feet. Or here's a government service. Or here's a government program that you can access. Here's the information for employment insurance, et cetera. And so it's a real wraparound service. Often the transfers that we make to people are warm transfers. So instead of just saying, call this number, we actually make that call for them. Uh, and are able to advocate for those people uh, in accessing those services. 211 is also used um, in, in crisis and disaster response. Uh, we've seen this in Alberta in the floods in 2013. Most recently in the US where 211 is very active, um, 211 played a large role in the response in Texas when they had the freezing in terms of allowing people access um, to key supports in, in crisis situations. Um, so one of the one of the key elements of that is that two on one is able to free up lines for emergency calls. So calls that go to nine one one, even calls that go to three one one, two on one can take a lot of those those non emergency calls uh, for individuals. So that um, first responders are freed up to to meet the particular needs um, that they need to handle. And so we work with nine one one pretty closely right now to handle. Uh, you know, I think it's. 
45% of calls that go to 911 are actually are non-emergency. And so we're working with them to be able to take a lot of those calls. Um, two on one is much cheaper than, than a 911 call or even a 311 call. And so we're able to have some system efficiencies related to that. And in a collaborative manner, we're also working right now with the downtown community safety uh, partnership in um, being able to triage and support people. Uh, if you see someone who's in a bus shelter and they need particular support, um, being able to send out, you know, whether it be um, a social worker or some sort of community response team uh, to free up paramedics and other um, more emergency services. Uh, we are working with people related to that. Uh, I won't get into all of the collaborations, but we work in um, a very collaborative manner. We have 5,000 records across uh, Manitoba that we try to keep updated and we do that uh, through particular partnerships, but I won't get into all of them uh, in the interest of time. But just to get to the, the issue at hand in terms of food security, and, and one of the reasons that I wanted to talk with you is the number three reason that people call um, 211 is for emergency food. Uh, and the majority of those calls are coming uh, from Winnipeg. Uh, and so um, it's really important and paramount that uh, 211 is as good a referral service as the information is that we have available to us. Uh, so any particular programs, any initiatives that are aimed towards um, assisting in food security in Winnipeg, it's great to let us know about that. Uh, and we can play a part in, in connecting people to those um, particular services. In the beginning of the pandemic, we played a role with 311. This was before the, the 211 phone line was launched, but using our database with 311 and with agent opportunities in getting food hampers to people who needed it uh, when the lockdown um, first began. And so uh, we're able to play that role. We'd actually be able to play that role much better now that we have the phone line and actually taking calls and connecting people um, for emergency food services. Uh, and this goes beyond um, particular types of um, food security services. So food banks is, is the one that people think of, of most often, uh, but we also have services and connections to people with community gardens, um, Winnipeg Harvest, but also part of food security is just employment. That's how all of us access food, we purchase our food. Uh, and so connecting people with, with employment opportunities is one of uh, the key, key goals of, of 211. So moving forward, and I'll end here uh, for questions, um, sharing, as I mentioned, sharing any resources that you have available um, for food initiatives, either in Winnipeg and those of you who work outside of Winnipeg, even in, in uh, the province more broadly is, is very helpful. Um, but also one of the values that two on one can play is giving statistics back to policymakers around um, gaps and service gaps that people have. So we're able to drill into the data that we have to say, you know, we've gotten 20 calls from, let's say, Transcona and people were asking for a food bank and we don't have a food bank to connect them to. Uh, and so we're able to provide those statistics to policymakers and uh, others to identify places where there's high need and where people are not getting their needs uh, particularly uh, met. And I think generally a general point, and I'll finish with this, is just to recognize that 2 on one can play an important role in the infrastructure of food security in Winnipeg, uh, that we can play a role in connecting people to information, um, to identifying these policy gaps and service gaps. Uh, and so please consider us and please um, uh, use us as you will um, uh, for any of the particular aims that you have within, within your committee. So. I will end there, um, speaking quickly. Hopefully that gives you a, a good idea of what uh, two on one is. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them now or offline at any time. And thank you, that was, that, was, uh, that was very helpful. Well, clearly said and, uh, and kept up a good pace there. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to see your screen. I don't, but ah, uh, much All right, yeah. Any questions? I think Levon. Yeah, Levon, fire away. Yes. Okay, nice to meet you, Daniel. Nice to um, meet you. Thank you so much for that presentation. And for me, it's uh, it's actually um, I've heard this a couple times, just with some of my other uh, just my other work. I work in the in the health region in public health, and I just want to say that I I am. The fact that 211 Manitoba finally went to a phone service has been 
tremendous for the community. Um, that was a very, very good move. As um, so I work, I work in community in the downtown and we're constantly getting uh, requests from sort of like the, the other health region folks um, and, and even acute care of um, give us an inventory of programming in the community that, you know, if we're talking about food that can provide food service. The problem is that that inventory will change weekly. So we, I, I you know, I don't make an inventory. Um, and what we only had before was we had the online service with two on one, which was quite cumbersome. So I just want you to know that this is a very important service for community um, and agencies as well as um, the health system. So I don't know how much connecting in you've done even within the acute care system um, as they're discharging folks is to have ensure that you know people know that 211 is a resource for them to call because people, you know, not everybody knows what exists in community. And even as someone who works in community, somebody asked me, where, where are the cooking classes? I'm like, I don't know right now because it's all grant-based and it's constantly changing. Um, and, and that's just the way it is. So again, I, I, I love this, it's super exciting. Um, I think there's so much potential for uh, robust partnerships across multiple sectors. Um, I think that really it's just um, being really um, em enmeshed in community so that they're updating their information. And I know that's a whole process and, I, and I'm aware of it um, because again, those of us sort of at, at a different level, we, we don't always know what's going on. It, it's sort of the community. I'm really interested in sort of the whole data sharing pieces. So I'll probably connect with you later um, just, just to sort of see what, what some of those, those things are and how they might help support um, some of the work that's occurring in, in public health more at a regional level. Um, yeah, so again, just, I, I think this is really great and I just wanna encourage you and support you that the work is, is uh, it, it's really needed and really important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay. And having used the word robust, I will, of course, give the yellow card to Levon. And if she uses the word pivot, we will, of course, issue the red card and kill, kick her out of the meat. What? <laughs> There's some humor, humor about the use of those words. Uh, anyway, very good question. Uh, uh, seeing no further questions oh sorry jason fire away yeah thanks it, it, by the one of the, the the charts maps you showed us it looked like winnipeg or manitoba was really singled out as uh, sort of being behind with with most other provinces is there a reason for that just curious um yeah that's a good question uh i don't know all all of the history behind that um why we were why we were later than other provinces i don't certainly not from a, a um who's responsible sort of standpoint uh the funding that kicked in province-wide um was a federal initiative that went across canada uh so the federal government kicked 10 million dollars in in last fall uh using emergency funds and that enabled uh us to kick up the infrastructure to um actually launch the phone line uh, and so it's very hard, as Levon was saying, um, people don't really see the, you know, initially the value of records when we only had a website, uh, people would say, well, what's the difference between using your website and just Googling this information? Uh, and so we really de-emphasize the website and, and emphasize the wraparound service of, um, of the call information. And so until we had a long way to answer your question, until we had resources to develop the phone line, it was pretty slow going uh, in, in Manitoba. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the presentation. That, that I, I learned from that, that was useful. Thank you for that. So we are on then to our next presentation, Madam Clerk. Correct. And so thank you, Ms. Jones. As a note, that presentation will also be included with the meeting minutes as it was shared by the presenter. Next up, we have a presentation from Ms. Alexandra Brokey from the University of Winnipeg, uh, sorry, University of Manitoba. 
with respect to pro bono student Canada's research into community garden liability. So we are admitting Ms. Brogy and we've got screen sharing. Okay, Ms. Brogy, we can see your screen. Hey, and look at that. Able to start your presentation. All right, that sounds great. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Yep. Um, and yes, as of what, what was just stated, I, I'm a student uh, from the Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba. And uh, over this past academic year, I was uh, fortunate enough to work with the uh, Winnipeg Food Council on some research that they had requested we do. Um, so it was myself and three other students on uh, community gardens. And so uh, this, uh, this presentation is just basically gonna summarize the findings in the report um, that was attached to uh, the agenda. All right, so just an overview of what we're going to be discussing. Um, first, we began with a jurisdictional scan, which is what myself and another student had worked on. And basically what we had done is um, we reached out to a number of community gardens um, across Canada in various cities, uh, just basically to determine how they were run, uh, the costs associated with the gardens, where they would receive their water sources, um, the maintenance, who would be responsible for maintenance of the gardens. And so we just asked a broad um, range of questions to uh, a few different community gardens, um, like I said, in different cities across Canada. Uh, then we had another student working on um, liability. So what is, uh, have, have there, has there been any case law involving liability of uh, people who had been potentially injured in gardens? Um, and then uh, the fourth student had worked on lease agreements. Um, so just to determine whether uh, lease agreements um, were the predominant, lease agreements or uh, use for land agreements um, uh, were the predominant form of uh, agreement when basically uh, people want to start a garden um, they can either have a license or a lease and so we just wanted to determine what was most uh, most commonly being used um, whether it was one or the other or both and then finally with this past year we have had uh, to make uh, or a number of gardens have had to make COVID-19 accommodations so we did include um, a little bit uh, of, uh, of uh, basically our findings, just that would come up naturally in conversation, um, just to see how the gardens continue to operate, whether they even um, were able to remain open, and if they did, what kind of um, factors or what kind of uh, new considerations had to be made in order to ensure that the gardens were operating um, in a safe manner. All right, so uh, for the jurisdictional scan, we did reach out uh, to gardens located in eight different cities. Um, and Basically, to summarize, what we found is that at, at the end of the day, my answer is constantly going to be, um, it really depends. Every garden is very different and every city has set up a different um, structure and how they run their gardens. We have seen um, most cities uh, that we had reached out to had supports from nonprofit org organizations who would be uh, responsible for um, basically the networking, as well as uh, if people wanted to start new gardens, they would reach out to the nonprofit who would then be in contact with the city. However, there were also cities who worked um, independently without the support of nonprofit organizations. For example, um, Brampton was one of those cities. So they are not currently working alongside any other organizations. And then some cities had support from um, more than one organization. So it really just depends um, on the city and what works best for them. Um, so in Halifax, all community gardens um, must be operated by a nonprofit uh, and no direct fees are payable to the city. And that's something we found that was quite synonymous amongst um, the various cities that we reached out to is that uh, the cities do not collect fees. It's typically um, the individual gardens that are responsible for collecting um, uh, gardening fees if they so choose to request them in order to maintain or run the garden. And those fees differ depending on plot size is being offered, um, whether you are coming in just to use, uh, for example, a gardening bed, it would be much different than um, a large plot that you're using to, uh, to grow food for potentially multiple households. And so there's different fees, um, but in addition to that, um, the fees are oftentimes waived if uh, the individual expresses that uh, they're not able to pay them. And so it's been quite, what we've seen was that it was quite a flexible, um, quite a flexible process, but the fees are then used strictly to maintain the garden and for um, maintenance such as um, um, 
implementation of fencing, for example. So you wouldn't necessarily be responsible for that for your own plot. Um, it would be the garden coordinator that would use those funds to maintain the premises. Um, in Saskatoon, the city of Saskatoon provides assistance um, with the application process of community gardens and provides the initial funds for cultivation and irrigation of new community gardens. Um, so basically, uh, in, uh, in, a, in some cities, uh, if, you, uh, if you reach out and say, you know, I would like to start a community garden and there's interest involved. I have um, a number of individuals in my community who uh, we would like to start this garden. We have a potential plot. Um, some cities will uh, support in a way that um, they will actually provide all the resources and the materials necessary um, for uh, to basically get the garden off the ground and running, so to speak. Whereas other cities um, we found uh, you really had to have the funding already ready to go. Um, some cities would be more open to helping you uh, a fundraise or um, provide more resources uh, through grants. Um, but again, it really depends on the city and the funds that they have available to them. Um, in the city of Brant Brampton, uh, they offer the initial installation of the community garden plots, which includes soil, the wood framed planters, wood chip pathways, signage and storage sheds. The city also provides for waste removal at the end of the year and that a community garden application form is required. This waste removal is something that it again really depends on the city. Um, so we've seen that some gardeners are responsible entirely for their waste removal um, for their own plot. And uh, then it would be the coordinator that would be responsible for maintaining uh, communal areas, for example, pathways between the gardens. Um, in Edmonton, formation of a garden group, planning and designing take place with the community greening coordinator, um, building and operation of the garden to follow, and grants are available through the city. So again, a number of grants are typically available, and if not, um, the, the main means of, of uh, receiving funds would be through fundraising or um, donations. Now, the next four cities that we uh, examined were Mississauga, Hamilton, Regina, and Calgary. So in Mississauga, member gardeners are required to pay a yearly maintenance fee of uh, approximately $50 to contribute to shared tools and resources for um, gardeners. Uh, in Hamilton, the community garden network program is run by a nonprofit called Neighbor to Neighbor. Uh, the manager of food access and skills is responsible for running and maintaining the garden networking program. And this is an individual um, who does receive a paid salary. And so this is an additional cost that this uh, particular city has um, chosen to incur in order to have someone responsible, a paid individual responsible for maintaining the gardening network. And so basically that has allowed um, a map to be available so that you can actually see where each community garden is located in the city and they can be in contact with one another um, through this one individual. Or if anyone has questions about where, you know, if a member of the community said, oh, I would like to begin gardening, I just want access to a plot, um, they actually can, you can go online and look yourself at this, uh, at this map that is maintained by this individual. Uh, in Regina, community gardens throughout Regina are operated by the zone boards and community associations. Um, Regina's largest community garden is operated by Grow Regina and is an incorporated nonprofit that operates uh, independently of the other gardens in the city. And so Regina was uh, rather unique in that they do have this one kind of very large garden that they're operating. And um, it's, uh, it has been uh, operated um, outside of, it, it's basically its own entity, almost, so to speak, and it's, it's a, a number of community members who have come together and have, um, um, you can see that there's a lot of community support and a lot of um, volunteers and a lot of, uh, um, it's a garden that has been in operation for a while, and I know that they have had kind of a growth process because of the community support and interest that they have received, and so they've kind of, um, to, taking things into their own hands, so to speak, and have continued to grow and branch off um, on their own terms. Um, and then in Calgary, community gardens are listed and kept track of by the Calgary Horticultural Society. If you would like to start a community garden, you must have approval from the City of Calgary Parks Department. And again, that's pretty synonymous amongst most of these um, cities is that there is an application process involved, um, forms to be filed, and you have to have at least an idea of a plan before you're going to be beginning um, a garden if that's something that you're interested in doing. 
Um, so a summary of the jurisdictional scan, uh, costs. So again, some cities will cover the startup costs, whereas others pr will provide grants and funding. Um, for maintenance, maintenance is typically the responsibility of the garden's coordinator and the gardeners who tend to the plots. So again, typically there's one to two coordinators of a garden who would be responsible for those communal um, areas of the garden, as well as if there's shared tools, um, if there's uh, fencing or cribbing between the garden plots, uh, just to make sure that everything is being maintained and upkept. And if something is um, needing replacement or anything of that nature, then the coordinators would be responsible for that. Um, for insurance, uh, liability insurance, uh, typically it, it really varies in amounts. And I've seen uh, uh, ranges from one to 5 million in most jurisdiction. Uh, in most jurisdictions, my apologies. Um, although some gardens are covered through pre-existing insurance that may exist through the nonprofit that runs them. Um, so for example, if you are a nonprofit organization that has already been existing and you already have your own liability insurance and you decide on your property, you would like to start a community garden, there is a possibility that that garden may already be covered through your pre-existing insurance if it meets the standards that the, the city requires. And for water, uh, most gardens are responsible for paying for their own water. And it is typically the costliest expense of operating a community garden. Um, that was the one big factor when coming forward to the city saying, hello, you know, we would like to start a new community garden. Um, the first question is, do you have water? And if water isn't readily accessible, it's probably gonna be a matter of, is there any other locations that already have water that would be um, more easy to have access or more easy to use that is already um, on city property. And so an example of that would be a number of parks um, in the winter time will have water access because of uh, the formation of ice rinks. So for skating in the winter time, you already have that water hookup. And so sometimes um, what will be encouraged is to look for spots um, for community gardens that are uh, going to be close enough that they can kind of um, um, I guess, tether off of that water line or uh, just it would be easier to provide an extension when something's already pre-existing. And when it's not already put in place, um, that would be a very costly expense. And typically it's it's uh, not encouraged. And of course, we've seen um, some people will truck in water. But again, that is a, a, another uh, concern with regard to reliability. And now for liability. Um, so based on the research that was conducted by uh, my colleague, there appears to be no liability cases involving a community garden in Canada. Um, occupiers are generally responsible to keep their premises uh, reasonably safe, although what is considered reasonable will, will depend on the circumstances of, e of each garden, of each case, of each circumstance. Um, garden clubs may be required to get liability insurance as part of their lease agreement, and others will have a waiver in the gardener agreement when someone joins the club. Um, produ produce donated from community gardens will attract liability if the produce was unfit for human consumption or injury was intended. The Food Donations Act does not apply to someone selling their produce for profit. And again, a number of these gardens, um, we saw that there were strict policy stating that you cannot sell your produce for profit. It, it is to be consumed for yourself or donated, or if it is sold to the community, those funds have to go directly back into the support of the garden. So the garden maintenance, um, purchasing of tools, supplies, whatever the case may be. And then for land use and lease agreements, as seen in the jurisdictional scan, uh, land use agreements or licenses between the city and the community garden group are typically used um, if the land is provided by the city. On average, these agreements range from one to five years, and leases are much less common. And they often come along with a number of conditions limiting the leasee and how they can use the property. Um, I've seen, uh, of course, um, uh, certain conditions or statements stating that you cannot, you know, alter the state of the land, you cannot take anything away from the land, you can't um, take the soil off the land, for example. And so um, typically uh, licenses are used just because um, uh, there's there's not as much, um, what's the word I'm looking for? With licenses, they can, if, if, so, if some kind of negligence of that nature were to occur, it's much easier to terminate. And so uh, licenses do not provide as much security for a tenant as a lease would, as they can be um, easily terminated and they do not grant um, exclusive possession of the land. Um, so with a lease agreement, uh, typically there are a number of conditions that will be um, listed that will need to be followed uh, by the landowner. 
and COVID-19 accommodations. So many gardens did remain open last season, so long as COVID restrictions and community guidelines uh, were followed. Some gardens remained closed, specifically a select few located on school property. Uh, Brampton began a backyard garden program, which involved the city providing free seeds and soil to residents to grow food in their backyards, with the understanding that some would be donated to support food security through the pandemic. Um, I think another uh, influencing factor to starting these new programs as well is that um, with everyone being, I guess, cooped up inside, there was a lot more demand and desirability in, in gardening. And so there was actually a, a much higher demand and uh, a lot more interest um, last summer than previous summers to begin gardening. And so uh, these uh, backyard garden programs, if you weren't able to find a plot, uh, were a great substitute or a great alternative to still be able to um, begin your own garden. Edmonton uh, began a pop-up community garden plot program. The city created raised garden planter kits that uh, operation teams delivered to various communities and filled with soil. Conditions of these garden plots included that they only be used to grow food, and that the city would provide water twice a week. Uh, some gardens did not permit the sharing of tools. So for example, um, if there were shovels or hoes or rakes or anything of that nature that were um, previously uh, provided by the, the garden coordinators for communal use, um, typically they were not being used last summer just uh, for safety concerns. Um, in addition, uh, there were uh, additional expenses to purchase sanitization supplies, such as hand wipes located um, at the watering station. So anywhere where, um, of course, you still need access to water. So anything that was going to be um, used by more than one gardener, uh, they had to ensure that there was going to be adequate uh, sanitization supplies present. And so that was an additional expense that some gardens um, incurred. Now uh, that it wraps up my presentation, uh, if I have any questions. Thank you for the presentation. I think Councillor Schreier had a question. I, I have a couple, but uh, Councillor Schreier, fire away. Yeah, a wonderful presentation. Uh, given the study across across the country, were there, do you know if other jurisdictions did cross jurisdictional studies? That's a great question. Um, as far as I'm aware, most of the people that I reached out to, as well as um, one of my other colleagues, uh, were actually very excited to see this report. Um, so I think uh, as far as we are aware, um, there hasn't been much, much cross jurisdictional studies that have uh, have occurred, at least that we are aware of. And it seemed that there was actually quite a bit of interest to receive um, a report of this nature or similar to this um, in order to see just basically what we found. I just want to put a comment out there. It looks like we might end up, by virtue of this, have the potential to to really have the best system or um, help the rest of the country um, and enhance their system by virtue of this specific report. Um, well done. It was a great idea, and it seems to me well executed. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I mean, that pro bono means you're, you guys were volunteering to do this. So thank you for that. All second year students, third year students? Uh, um, three, myself and two other students, uh, we just completed second year and there was another student who has just completed first year. Oh, okay. So I'll scrap the question about articling then and where you're off to because it's governor of the year. So we'll leave that till, till next year. You, there, there was a reference in the presentation to the Food Donations Act. I don't know if that's your part of the, pre if, if you wrote that section or not, but what, is that provincial? Is that federal? I, I don't think I've ever heard of the Food Donations Act. Any, any light you could shed on that for us? Um, you know what, I, I will admit that was not part of my uh, specific research, but I do believe it uh, in the the research that was conducted, it said the Food Donations Act in Manitoba. So I do believe that it was a provincial um, act. Okay, so we'll follow up on that. Thank you. And yeah, because that's, uh, yeah, that, that may have some relevance for, for what we're doing. Um, and yes, you, as, as you say, water it tends to be the great uh, equalizer or the great question in, in all of these projects that we've tried to do or tried to look at. Um, but thank you for the, I, I think Jeanette helped put this together or Karen. And so thank you for, and I, we, we didn't always make it easy to get this thing going. So thank you for the, your persistence with this. Um, it, uh, I think Karen has a question down there. Bottom. Yes. Yeah, if that's okay, sorry to interrupt. Um, 
I know I, this is, this is wonderful. And it's so great to, to see this come to, to fruition. And uh, I hope it's not a, a red or yellow card word, but I want to capitalize on <laughs> what uh, Councillor <laughs> Schreier just said. Um, and, and I think like, this is actually a really good resource that we could, could um, potentially share with other jurisdictions, as well as um, just kind of having this information. It's, it's nice to have this information at our fingertips. And I'm wondering what the rules are as far as sharing this information, if the Food Council needs to vote um, to, to make this available to other jurisdictions, because it is, I think, the Food Council's property. Um, and just wondering, yeah, just putting that question out there for, for people to, to consider, because I don't know the answer. I know for um, from the pro bono students Canada side of things, all of the research that we conduct and the organization that we work for, um, everything that we do is meant to be kept confidential. And so it, it would be up to the organization to decide um, how or if they would like to uh, distribute uh, the research that we conduct. Okay. So it might be something for the Food Council to consider, yeah, um, yeah voting to, to share it with other jurisdictions if they ask. Okay. Uh, again, not seeing further questions. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, sorry, uh, Levon had a question. So. Go ahead, Levon. Sorry, maybe you don't see my little hand that's up here. <laughs> um, Alexandra, thanks uh, again too for uh, for participating in this project. It has been it was took a, took a, quite a while to get you guys. Um, uh, to get this going, we've been we've been talking about community gardens since day one at this food council. So this is really exciting, and I just want to ask um, a question related to the water piece and your comments surrounding um, the the idea of creating garden plots where water already exists, right? And this is a no brainer, um, and I think that we have had you know, sort of a few conversations related to that, perhaps not um, in, in big scope, but just even thinking about the, um, the current parks and recreation strategy that, you know, has been out for um, consultation and feedback. And I know that as the, uh, the health authority, we have provided um, specific feedback related to health and public health. And one of the things is that when we think about parks and rec, can we reframe how we think about the land that's associated with even just thinking about recreation centers, like you mentioned with skating, right? Like they, and rec centers have water. Um, and, but my, my sense is some of the pushback is that, no, 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 you can't use that green space. That's our green space. However, a lot of these centers, mine included, right, has, they have a, a lot of green space. Um, whereas, you know, a few little planter boxes wouldn't really take up that much space. So I'm, my, my question is, was there resistance? Like, did you sense that any within any of the cities, like was there resistance sort of from that city aspect, like city departments or, or sort of not, um, you know, that requires different departments to kind of connect together and think more broadly about, about a vision of, you know, sort of a local foodscape. Um, there was some hesitation with regard to if there wasn't going to be a water source, um, I, I suppose some people who had really wanted to start a brand new um, community garden said, oh, you know, it's no problem. We have uh, someone who's going to be trucking in the water. And I know that some cities were very hesitant to move forward with plans that required water from an outside source. Um, just because depending on, you know, mother nature, how much rain are we going to anticipate this year? And if it doesn't rain for three weeks, are we going to need to have an extra truckload that we weren't anticipating? And then what if that truckload can't come for another week? Are the gardens going to, you know, dry out? And so um, there was a lot of hesit hesitancy, but the answer that I got is that we wouldn't just turn them away. We would, we would, if they were really confident that this water supply was you know, very reliable. They, the outright answer wasn't just no, it was there were, they would consider it. But um, typically, they wanted to see that there was going to be um, a water source that would be that was already implemented that would be more reliable that was something already roughed in or that they could tether off of another, um, like we said, like a community center. And then as far as um, resistance from 
community centers themselves or the, the, the land that they would be kind of taking the water from. Um, I didn't hear anything with regard to resistance, but again, that would be part of um, the planning process. And so um, I'm assuming that if there was resistance, then they probably would have had to relocate or look at alternative um, um, options. Um, I know that when Grow Regina relocated their garden to this newer larger site, I believe it's 3.5 acres, it's quite large, um, their irrigation was the, mo the co most costly um, expense prior to beginning the garden that they had to consider and there was a lot of fundraising um, involved in order to have that happen. Um, so again, I think when you have the community support and the community involvement and there's that demand, um, I think it becomes a lot easier to uh, to find people who are willing to raise the money to implement things like irrigation or, or uh, um, the water source if, if it's going to require funding. Um, and then as I do know that I recall talking to an individual um, with regard to, uh, I had asked, you know, had any gardens closed recently and if they had closed, why? And um, there was one garden that basically the use of the land and the water was from an agreement, a handshake agreement um, mm -hmm. from years ago. And uh, I guess the, the land um, came in under new management or new ownership and they realized we don't really have a contract or, or any kind of a real lease agreement or license um, for you to use the, the land. And um, so they had explained what the handshake agreement was and what had, they had been doing for a number of years. And it just wasn't going to work out with it. They weren't uh, willing to really um, cooperate. And so I'm not sure how much that has to do with the water aspect. It's, I guess, more so involves the, the, the land agreement. But um, I, I suppose where I'm going with that is, it, although someone, unless you have a, a set in stone contract that, you know, three years, five years, one year renewal, um, it is potential, it, there's a possibility that if new ownership arises, or, or someone, you know, new comes, comes down the line five years from now, that people may have um, different different perceptions on, you know, maybe I don't want you using my water anymore. And so it's definitely, there's potential that there could be a conflict or that there may be um, some tension to that regard. But as far as I'm aware, um, there was nothing that was, you know, um, brought to my, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for that. And I think too, sometimes it just requires a reframing based on the jurisdiction, right? So um, and that sometimes needs to happen internally within the, like the municipal structure. Um, okay, and just other quick question. The Edmonton pop-up is fascinating to me. Um, do you know, like, was there any sort of report or, or outcome of that? Like, did that work really well? Um, do you know the outcome of the pop-up? I'm not too sure. Um, I know it was something that was um, quite supported by the community, um, but I'm not actually sure as to uh, how successful it was, how much, you know, food was actually grown that was able to be used. Um, I know what's difficult starting a, a garden from scratch is that sometimes depending on what you are growing, it can take years until you have a crop that's actually um, harvestable to the point where uh, you have a good yield, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so I'm not exactly sure um, as to how successful they were, um, but that would definitely be a, a great thing to look into um, for this this summer if they're planning to continue that um, a similar pop up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation, and uh, yeah, giving us a lot to work on and, uh, and follow up with. So uh, thank you, and uh, good work putting this together to uh, to Jeanette and Karen and others as well. Okay, Madam Clerk, do we need, we don't need a motion on that. We do, do I'm sorry. So uh, we need a motion for receiving the presentation from Mr. Leonard and Ms. Brophy, both presentations of information. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Levon, maybe you did move that we receive those two presentations of information. Uh, thanks, all those in favor? Aye, thank you. Um, and any opposed? No. So we'll move on then to number three, which is the subcommittee reports. And we've got um, Asha and Abby. Okay. So I think Asha is up first then. I'm sorry, Asha, we're not hearing you. You're you're unmuted. We can but we see you, but we can't hear you. 
Can you now? There hey. you go. Oh, great. Uh, Zoom is so complicated. Um, yes, thanks everyone. Uh, so the research and policy subcommittee met on March 30th um, just to discuss the path forward for a number of research projects that this committee has kind of been overseeing and supporting. Um, so to start, we reviewed the Pro Bono Students Canada's research project, um, who you all just heard from, and we were really impressed with the extensiveness of their research. Um, it led to some discussion about the difference between community gardens and allotment gardens. Um, and we found that many people in our committee um, and just more generally probably don't have a, a good understanding of the difference between the two. Um, so from this, we decided together that it would be good to see more data and research conducted on, on these different, the difference between these garden spaces. Um, as well as to uh, talk to individuals who might be able to help us gain a better understanding of how these two um, compare. So I think knowing their difference and the benefits and, sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> knowing their difference and the benefits and drawbacks of each would just help us make more informed policy recommendations to the city. Um, we also reviewed uh, the edits to the community garden report from the parks department um, and decided to move the section on their own jurisdictional scan as it was already covered in the Pro Bono Students Canada research project. Um, there was also a discussion on the Meadowood Victory Gardens research project and specifically what types of resources um, the researchers could, be, could create um, to support the public in, in being able to use this research. Um, so this then sparked, I think, a conversation about how it, we, we believe it would be good to help support community gardens um, with connecting with one another so that they could better share resources and knowledge. Um, so as many of you know, starting and maintaining a community garden requires a ton of work. Um, and as a result can act as a barrier for some community uh, groups to actually get one off the ground. And so we definitely think it would be good for, for us to find a way to um, support community gardens in, that, in their um, ability to connect with one another and make sure that knowledge and resources is shared amongst one another. Um, and then finally, we just thought it would be good to mention that um, one of our non-Food non Council members is working with Bike Week Winnipeg to set up a tour of community gardens in Winnipeg during the week of uh, June 7th to 13th. Um, so that's really exciting and will help to just uh, highlight some of the work that this, the Food Council has been doing and, and other really great initiatives in our city. Um, so we're really grateful and we just, yeah, wanted to say that we're really grateful for all our non-Food Council members um, who bring to this community a lot of valuable insights and relationships. And so, yeah, that's everyone, everything. Thank you. Yeah, let us know, please, about that uh, bike Winnipeg connection. That's that would be cool to to be part of that. Uh, Councillor Schreier has a question for you or a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that bike week. So bike week is June seventh to thirteenth, and they're going to do a bike tour of community gardens. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's okay, <laughs> so I'm putting that on my calendar. That's all. Um, and whom should I speak with about this to find out more about it? Like um... what what the group will be kind of thing what community gardens they'll be they'll be uh looking to hit kind of thing yeah i don't know the details about this i know that like the organization bike week winnipeg is the one putting it on so they would probably have a little bit more details oh yeah so it's bike week winnipeg not bike winnipeg That's yeah yes it's bike week winnipeg supposedly those are different <laughs> thank you all right thank we we don't need to vote on that report Yet we we hear the other one. One solid subject. Okay, yes. very good. Okay, thanks, Asha, for that. And uh, Abby, I think is up next. Yes. Hi. Morning. Um, the development subcommittee, um, communication subcommittee. We had a short meeting on April first. We discussed about the community gardens that uh, development at the West Coast on an arena, and I've been working with. Um, the Refugee Immigrant Farming and Integration in Manitoba. Uh, Raymond Nagorbi is the representative of that group to establish a rainbow community garden on site. So according to Raymond uh, and also other community members, there's been a great need for the garden space for newcomers in Winnipeg. So even more this year, due to the pandemic, 
they have to self-isolate, some of them, and of course, the increasing food prices as a result of this pandemic. Uh, this project has been well supported by Councillor Edi, who is the, the area councillor for Raskeldonan. We are also excited to be working with the Harvest Manitoba on the Meadowood, Meadowood Victory, Victory Garden this year. Ryan Marion, who also participates on the Research Policy Subcommittee, Janet and I have been working together with the Harvest Manitoba in regards to the garden planning. We also continue to have a great relationship with St. Vital Arena Fox and the minor Hockley there, who have been generously offered their help um, with the garden project over the summer as needed. So that's really a very good news. And at our meeting, we also discussed the garden project um, for Norwest Community Food Center. Uh, we are hoping to have a um, access to a bigger garden site close to um, uh, uh, Billy Musienko Arena. And uh, this is only on a planning stage right now. Um, my coworker Stephanie Fulford is um, working with uh, Councillor Vivian Santos, and um, hopefully, this is the hope is that next year we will be able to start working on the project. But right now, it's only on the planning stage. I cannot provide more details, and maybe in the future, Stephanie Fulford can um, can be invited to this group to present about the project. So we also talk about our social media content for the summer months and discuss the details about the Love Food Hate Waste campaign that uh, launched for the springtime. At the time of our meeting, it hadn't been, hadn't been launched yet. Um, the Food Council as a whole has been very much involved in consulting on this campaign, and it's been good to see its rollout of this April. I hope you saw that campaign. And that's all our update for today. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thanks for your ongoing work on that West Kildonan uh, Arena project. That that would be great if we could get that. Uh, that that would be a good compliment to the one we have in the South End. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, uh, Levon, I think has a has a question. I really like to see what your screen looks like because <laughs> I I feel well, like I feel like we're like these little little blocks on your wall over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a comment or just add in that I, well, fine. So, you know, part of my role as the um, health authority rep, right, is to bring in pieces that fit within public health and within public health work. And I, so I finally got off in uh, sort of a draft email to all the other public health dietitians. There's a dietitian that is responsible for every community area of the city. And, uh, and sometimes they are paired community areas and um, included the, the Meadowood Victory Report. And so we're, we're sort of hoping that each dietitian will reach out to their city councilor um, and use that report as sort of a, a way to say, hello, um, this is who I am and to connect in. And as this might be an opportunity for partnership. And I mean, whether or not gardens continue in other wards um, or if you know that leads to potentially other sort of uh, initiatives and, and partnering work um, I think that's, that's always good but I also just um, like I'm just hopeful that you know hopeful that the the city councillors will be as sort of supportive as, as um, those that the two of you that are sitting here today and some of the others that that we've heard about that Abigail just mentioned that um uh, we'd like to reach out and, you know, try to develop some collaborative partnerships that are really intentional on working through some some food security pieces. Yeah, that's it. It, it is. Uh, thank you for that. I know. Yeah, Councilor Shar has been uh, been a great champion of what we've been doing at the Food Council. So, um, yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan. I might be your. I'm a big fan. I mean, there's more for me to, to, to do and to be involved with and engage with, but I have a report, if I may, uh, Brian, at the end, if I can give a little report yep. in terms of sure. trying to keep up with the rest of us here. Okay. If, if there are no uh, further questions for uh, for Abby, then uh, can we have uh, Blair, I can see you down at the bottom of the screen now. Could you move? Uh, I guess we're just receiving the reports as information. 
And if you can move that, then uh, all those, all those in favor. Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, so we'll have that. Uh, those moved as information. Uh, number four is uh, update on coordinator hiring process. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the director of Moria Gear here, so we can't really do anything with that. Unfortunately, so we'll have we'll have more sometime soon, hopefully, on the, the coordinator position. Would you like to lay over this item? Yeah. Um, do we need that? We need a motion for that, probably. Um, all right. Uh, uh, can I just? Can I just? Sorry to interrupt. Can I just ask? Will Will we um, be? Will we be notified when the the position the posting goes out? As um, you know, just in case those of I mean, those of us all have our own network of folks that may be interested and in, and really good for the position to just to send out. Yeah, we'll. I'll, I'll ensure that that gets done. Okay. okay. Fair question. Okay. So uh, if we could have uh, Asha, if you could move to just lay this item over to our next meeting. Um, and we'll get uh, apologies that we didn't get that, that taken care of today, but uh, all those in favor of the layover to next meeting. Thank you. That passes. Um, and then number five is the, as you may remember, Jeanette had prepared a very detailed community gardens report that began its voyage uh, through the system. The Parks Department asked uh, for some time to review it, I guess. That's uh, now taking place. So I, do you want to speak to this one? Sure. Jenna? Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just mention um, that the Research and Policy Subcommittee looked over the, the proposed edits, as Asha mentioned, um, and concurred with them. So this is just um, the updated version. Um, also, I think uh, the Pro Bono Students Canada jurisdictional scan work um, fits really nicely um, as perhaps an attachment of some sort to this one. Um, but uh, yeah, this is just the, the the updated version for your consideration and and uh, yeah, and concurrence if that's the will. Okay, and then that would go back, I think, to I think it goes back to EPC, I think. Thank you. Not sure. I, I believe when we addressed it the first time in October, it was received as information, but if the will of the committee, it could be sent to UPC. Okay, yeah, I'll, uh, I can't hand the chair off. There's no one else here. All right, perhaps, uh, Nita, could you move that we, uh, we move that uh, over to executive policy committee then? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of that, thank you. That's carried unanimously. Uh, I think Councilor Schreier had a had a update there. Do we need to? All right. So uh, perhaps uh, Abby, could you move to suspend the rules so that we can hear from Councilor Schreier because that's not formally on the agenda. Thank you. All those in favor. We should note there was some nice coverage of Nita's appointment in the Indo-Canadian Telegram. Nice, uh, it was a nice article there recently. So it's it's online or in print if you're if you're looking. Um, all right. So, Councillor uh, Jason, um, fire away. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I've been talking for a while about you know I've, I'm I'm a member of this committee. The the mayor's uh, appointment. It's it's an honor and it's a privilege. It's my favorite committee. I, and I've always said on these some of these good committees that I, I'm, I'm part of it, but I don't really, you know, put out, I, I get more out of it than I put in. And of course, the obligation is one day make use of this. Um, one thing I've done, and I don't think I would have done it if I was, wasn't a member uh, of this food council or inspired by it. I got the idea last year, but I was a little too late. But now I'm doing it this year. Um, my wife, Sarah, and I bought 1 million carrot seeds, 500 pounds of peas. 720,000 peas about and we bought 20,000 baggies and we are personally labeling inserting okay. um here we are there is my peas and carrots in 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 one in one in one bag that we do a sctv 3d house of of peas and carrots whoop, whoop. anyway so uh there we are and uh from uh, from the counselor, so I'm going. We're going. Uh, Sarah and Jared and I, our son Jared, the three of us are walking down every single street in Elmwood and East Kildonan, 
And we've already done everything between on the on the Concordia constituency side, if you will, Matt Weeb's side, if you will, um, between Gateway and Lajemordia, we've already done everything from Nairn to Concordia. So of all of East Elmwood, all of East Monroe, uh, that area there, we're already in Valley Gardens um, on the east side of, of the uh, Northeast Greenway, Pioneer Greenway. Um, also earlier in the month, because I gave the idea to Jim Malloway last year, because for decades, Jim Malloway was always sending up forget-me-nots, flowers. And I thought, no, I'm on the food council, I'm gonna do food. And, and so he got the idea. So not to be outdone, um, uh, Jim started buying seeds from Mackenzie Seeds. I couldn't get my bulk order from Mackenzie Seeds. They referred me to Stoke Seeds at the Niagara Peninsula. And uh, they sent them here like, well, once the order was in three days, I got my two million seeds. And, uh, and so Jim's doing, Jim, for some reason, because he'd been buying from Mackenzie Seeds for 30 years as the MLA and the MP, he got this really good deal of 20 cents on the bag for stuff they had left over. And now these bags can be worth the retail, you know, a dollar 30 to $3 and 30. And he got them all in 20 cents. Now it's costing me um, less than 10 cents per bag, but it's highly labor intensive. Right now, as we sit, I'm labeling, I just got 200 bags labeled during this meeting. Um, and uh, so, Earlier in the month and last month, I've been handing out Jim seeds, going with Jim, handing out his seeds on the east and the west side of my ward um, in like Elmwood, East Kildonan, that area along Henderson, Highway, Watt Street. And um, and so uh, we're going to continue. And it looks like I can't believe how fast we're going. So I, so Jared, Sarah and I are doing about 80 percent of ourselves. I'm selfishly enjoying this because I walked in like a mini campaign. I don't knock on any doors, uh, but when I see people, that's the time. And, and, and uh, you know, Brian will know it's to knock on doors. You'll never get something done. Knock on every door. You're not going to get this done. But when you see people, you take advantage. You don't enter any houses. Of course, you engage people while you can, because there's no time wasted knocking on a door. It's been the majority of your time not waiting for an answer. That no one might answer, but uh, so there's lots of public engagement um, in this, and and uh, that's 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 another story. Mostly people are glad to have this. Maybe they're being polite, um, but but Jim never had any complaints in the 30 years he gave away forget me nots. Um, he never had any complaints. So um, I, I I do have some friends um, and neighbors helping out um, as well. Um, a few, um, but quite frankly, I'm enjoying this. It's great to get out of my uh, COVID winter hibernation, and geez, that I need this. So I'm glad to do it. I'm, I'm not a jogger like Brian Mays. Um, I'm not a golfer. I do like to dance and sing, but COVID really hinders that kind of thing. Yeah, I can dance around my house and I do that, but at least I'm out in a boat and getting some fresh air walking. Um, how many miles a day? I don't know, but uh, well, a lot. Let's face it, you'll see, I'll be doing an entire ward within three weeks, like it's incredible. Three more weeks, it seems. Um, and also another report on this, um, we had the, the, the mental wellness fund of $40,000 per ward. Um, and this was just federal funding that uh, uh, I guess council decided would be allocated by ward. And so uh, I'm not sure what Brian, what Brian did or other council, well, actually I could look, but, but uh, there were some applications, let's say through Elmwood High School, where uh, one of the teachers wanted to build a survival garden with the students. So I put a few thousand into, um, you know, the materials uh, to create a survival garden uh, at Elmwood High School, as well, Valley Gardens Middle School, um, they want to build a garden. So I put a few thousand dollars of that 40,000 wellness onto Valley Gardens Middle School so that they can uh, build a garden. And I think it's excellent when students um, have a gardening project, you know, you can lose the art or the inspiration or the insight into, you know, gardening. And, uh, and it's, so it's wonderful, at least through the, through the uh, education system that it's being encouraged and taught. And so I just had to encourage that as well. And all the time I'm feeling, you know, I'm doing my part uh, as, a, as a member of the food council, finally. So anyway, I'm doing something. And uh, if it wasn't for the Food Council, I don't 
think I would have thought of this. But uh, anyway, I'm kind of pleased with myself. And I owe that to, uh, to these circumstances. So, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that today because you mentioned it at, you know, we were here till I mentioned it somewhere yesterday. It was a 14 hour meeting. I can't remember exactly when. I thought, oh, I thought we, we, should, we should have that mentioned. So that's good. Thank you for doing that. And, and thanks for doing the, the project. Uh, uh, as a, as there, there is more to this. There's more to talk about. Um, I want to be involved. Once I'm done my drop, I'm just full of, I'm just getting full of energy, eh? So once I'm finished my drop, I'm, the, the, the goal is always by May long, because that's the tradition when gardens are kind of finished by May long. And that's essentially the hypothetical in my head that I got to be, I have to have all the seeds delivered before May long weekend. Um, and then after that, I'd like to help with community gardens. So Levon and, 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 and whomever, um, I'm going to need some guidance in terms of how I can assist on my ward, some, some community gardens just with my own, with my own hands. Uh, Abigail, right on. So with, with my own, I'm a digger, by the way. One of my jobs, I used to dig six feet down every day and fix house foundations. Um, so I'm, I'm a digger. Might as well make use of it uh, when it comes to the Food Council um, agenda. And uh, I want to help with some community gardens personally. And I'm going to need some guidance from that um, as we approach June well, I'm, or, or even May long when I have some time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Matt, Madam Clerk, do we, we don't. Do we need a motion to receive that? Okay. Uh, uh, to, to, to Abby will move to receive that, please. Uh, receive that report as uh, information. Thanks, Abby. Uh, all those in favor? And thanks, thanks, Councilor Schreier, for that. Uh, any other items, uh, Madam Clerk? That I am aware of. Okay. Uh, that to the committee. Okay, thanks, everyone. I'm not sure when our next meeting will be, other than it will not be the day after a city council meeting. If, Given, given the duration of those, uh, but we'll uh, obviously get that scheduled and get uh, an update for sure on the coordinator position. Okay, so then motion to adjourn from uh, from uh, from uh, Nita. Thanks. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. We uh, really appreciate that that we had quorum, and I know those two groups, uh, especially pro bono students. We we. They deserved a good hearing. So thank you everybody for, for uh, being here. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor.